I have to go help Sister Van Wagner set up. You're great. I think that. Uh, I'm just be you, me, and Robert. What? I'm just be you, me, and Robert. That's okay. He was just finishing. He, they asked him what he sees in the next three years, and he said 4,000 teach, 4, teachers. 4,000? 4, I'm putting my application in. It might take a year to.
It's recording. What? One viewer. Oh, so they have online viewers too. I'm not supposed to start yet, but I want to say hello to the one viewer out there, wherever you are. Thanks for joining us. <laughs> Hopefully things are great where you are. He was just standing. Hi. Come on in. Join the crowd. I know. I guess I got your class. Natalie, uh -huh. I saw you around yesterday. I'm Dan Tell me what you teach. I teach medical billing and coding. Oh, wonderful. Wow, what a, that's a needed skill. Yeah. You're one of those people that they're like, we need people like uh, that. I don't know. I'm the only um, instructor for my course right now. Oh, so really? I'm kind of the Lone Ranger. But. Wow, I'm confident I'll need a million of those on there. Do they talk to you that way? Do they? It's, it's growing. It's part of the medical assisting program, right. which is a two year. And it's one of those programs where a lot of the students, um, that's the, kind of the end of the road for them, and they're oh. going to start working right. Kind of more like a child school type of program. Right. Very specific set of skills, but mm -hmm. you can get a job right out of school. Right. So, yeah, I, uh, my background's in nursing. I was a nurse oh, wow. before I was a, a full time teacher in church. That, that, that there's, there are needs. It's growing. My daughter, um, will be a senior next year, she did a CNA program and was thinking about doing the MA medical assisting program at the tech center near her high school. She decided not to do it, but who knows, maybe online. Yeah. With yeah. you. Yeah. Guiding her. Tell, tell her to. That would be great. That would be great. It's always good when your children have marvelous skills. Yeah. It got me through school. I worked at the yeah. student I, I came to school here and worked at the student health center on campus for three years. And with, with okay hours, right? Yeah. Flexible hours. Most most Absolutely. people with those skills have flexible hours. Mm -hmm. And it's eight to five strictly. Yeah. For medical school. Okay. Right. Yeah. Very cool. <laughs> I don't know. You sure? <laughs> Your discussion of the hours told doesn't match my <laughs> Really? Are you, are you, are you uh, in nursing? I am. I have a master's in nursing. I, I worked at a hospital. I worked at a health department. And I worked in. Yeah, those are my. Uh, near or far? Did, From here? You're, yeah, From here to where I live. I, I worked at LDS Hospital in Salt Lake for Me seven too. years. Not for really? seven years. For how many years? Three uh, years? Seven, 18 years ago. Yeah, and what, and what part of the department did you work? I work on the medical floor. I work um, in step down cardiology unit. It was not like 19. Well, I worked my way through school to right. BYU <laughs> there. But so, and then I um, I went on a mission in 1983, which was in the middle of the time when I was working at the okay. LBS hospital. So it was like before and after that. Right. And then when I graduated with my bachelor's degree, then I went to the health department. So. Oh. So you got some public health. You are dark. I have a bachelor's degree in nursing from Weber State. Worked at LDS Hospital in newborn intensive care. Oh, I bet I saw you. Maybe I there. bet I was there. What years? When I well, ninety-seven to ninety. Yeah, ninety-seven to. Well, I got hired. Teaching the church full time in ninety-nine, so it was like ninety-six to ninety-nine. Actually, during those years, I was probably at the health department, department, but I was working with kids with babies that were just maternity, so I popped okay. up to the hospital. Okay. Yeah. I do the home side. Oh, you want me to start? Yeah. Um, There's so much pressure right now. A few more minutes for a few more. One, two. For like one, two people? I'll go when it's recording now. Yeah, and I'll be actually right back in here in just a minute. I have to still finish setting to be up. Can I go see how many viewers we have? I don't know if you can tell with that. Yeah, it says right here. Right, one viewer. If that's yeah, accurate, I was saying hello to them before everybody else came. I don't know who they are. Yeah, I'm glad they're here. Okay, we'll give it another couple of minutes. So yeah, so, so I worked 17 years at the health department. Wow. And I had a very a variety of hours, including like evenings and uh -huh. Saturdays. I did more class, community classes and stuff, but I never chose. <laughs> if you know what I mean, it's like this. Is Okay, I do a lot of right. That's great. So my master's degree in health education. There's a lot of people doing public health, master's degree right. health. That was so we're kind of two tracks, and I was on the health ed one, on the health ed one, and but 
I work with them. So I had a lot of public health classes and such. So anyway, well, good. Thanks for coming to be with us. We'll give it another minute. Let's see if we got. So now I'm thinking how I did it. Because I want to include more of like stories in well, medical terminology. Here in a second, I hope to find a help. Yeah, he asked me to wait just another minute, but uh, I, I, he asked me to start us. He was going to start us, Robert, but I guess there's some tech issues next door, so we'll serve our neighbor by trying to get ourselves started here in a minute. You think I can do it? Yeah. <laughs> it warms my heart. And I know you're sitting over here. I'll try and tip my computer monitor so that you can maybe see it. Let me see if I can. You know what? I'm not, I know what I got there. I can do that in 30 seconds. Sure. Sure. Sit my bag. Give me your money. Wrong table. I'm going to take that table. I have money. There. I don't know. Yeah, these chairs are good. Mm -hmm. My screen is dim because I failed to plug it in. And there's a lesson for us. <laughs> Uh, let's see, you need to plug in. It's good. We need to see. Oh, there we go. Can you see that over there in the corner? You can't see up here? If you'd like. All right, I'm going to check and see if we have online viewers again. Two. We've got two online viewers with us. So we'll count that as. Are there still people in the hallway? Just a few. A few more chairs coming in. Or else, who's coming from the furthest distance? Who flew in from the furthest? Anybody? Who's coming from back east? Where, where are you? Virginia. Virginia. Very fun. Baltimore. Baltimore. Very, very wonderful. Have you ever been to Rexburg before? Yeah. Okay. Have you? I grew up right here. Oh, in Rexburg? Well, right here. It's it's all the R <laughs> towns. When I, my my wife and I uh, went to school here uh, in the late eighties, early nineties. Elder Holland came once and did a devotional, and he assigned every section of the Hart Auditorium a city that started with R. You know, it was Rigby, Rexburg, Ryrie, uh, Roberts. You know, and so he would point, and everybody would shout their city, and it was fun. <laughs> That was fun. Yeah, and then he gave a follow-up address after that and said that because of the way that the university had changed, they would have to be international, right? Uh -huh. Rather than Roman. I vaguely remember him talking about that. Well, it's a blessing for me to be here with you today, and uh, I think it's good if we start. Uh, would it be okay if we had an opening prayer? I know we already had one in the other meetings. Is there anybody who would be willing to do that? I, I know that's me putting you on the spot. Would you please tell us your name and where you're from? Austin Sherliff. I currently live in Rigby. Rigby. Okay. Thanks, Austin. Our Lord, Father in heaven, we are grateful for this opportunity to come together and to be instructed, to learn how we can better serve students of BYU Idaho online. We pray the Spirit will be here, here um, to both help the instructor and to help us. That we may learn what we need individually to do to become better instructors. Pray for these things in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Thank you so much. Well, my name is Brother Daniel Preswich. I teach, uh, right now I'm piloting a course called Religion 275. It's a core, one of the new Cornerstone Institute classes. And uh, it will, I believe the plans are, is that it becomes one of the three pathway religion classes, along with two other Cornerstone classes, one being the 200 class, the Doctrine of Family. And so, like I said, we're piloting it now, and it's wonderful. We, we take the Book of Mormon, and we look at it by doctrinal topic as opposed to sequentially. And it's been, it's been a great semester. It is a lot of work if you've ever worked on a pilot class. It's a lot of work, and you learn a lot about, about how these courses are put together. And it's, I've been so grateful to be a part of that. I teach down in Salt Lake primarily at the Hunter Seminary, and I love teaching seminary. Uh, I teach an institute class generally one night a week, and then I, I teach online. So, uh, my background is in, in is in healthcare. I have a nursing degree. And I've worked for Mountain Healthcare as well. But uh, after I had taught full time and then went to work for them in their corporate offices, I just missed being in 
with students in the scriptures. So thanks for being willing to step into the scriptures with me a little bit today and to talk about how we might serve our students really in those first three ways that President Gilbert talked about in that one day, let's get six. So I want to start today with the Savior. It's always a good place to start. Uh, this is the moment in his life where he's just learned that his cousin and friend John the Baptist has been violently killed by by a very evil man in very evil circumstances, and he seeks to, to be alone. But uh, at this point in his ministry, everybody wants to be around him all the time, so it's really hard for him to find a place to be alone. And so he finds a place near the sea, uh, near the shores of the Sea of Galilee, and yet 5,000 men, we learn later in the story, plus women and children, um, come there, and he miraculously feeds them with the five loaves and two fishes. Um, when he's taught them and blessed them and fed them, he invites them to leave, including his apostles, who he invites to get into a boat, and he goes up the, alone to pray with his heavenly Father, as he's so often he, he felt the need to pray. Uh, to complete the ministry that he worked out for each of us. Well, as he's praying during the night, he perceives and sees that his apostles are in trouble out on the water. And so he goes out to rescue them as the great rescuer. And, you know, you know the story. You know the story well. There's the wind and the waves, and they see him, and they think it's a spirit, and they start to panic. And then he says, you know, be not afraid. It's I. Uh, be of good cheer, in fact, he said. It is I. Be not afraid. Great commandment there that I struggle with sometimes. And Peter answered him and said, Lord, if it be thou, bid me come unto thee in the water. If it's really you, have me come to thee. And he said, come, Peter. And when Peter was come down out of the ship, he walked on the water to go to Jesus. Uh, what a moment that must have been for Peter to be invited to do something that he knew was far beyond his capacity, that stretched him, that stretched his faith, that stretched his trust in the Savior. And you know there's a little more to this story here in a minute, but I want to pause and stop right here at that moment where the Savior says, Peter, okay, come to me. Hop out of that boat and, and you come to me and you're going to learn something in the process. Master teachers teach like Jesus Christ. They invite their students to extend themselves in ways that are personal to them. Interestingly, it was just Peter who he invited out of the boat. Um, I'm sure if we had the record of each apostle, we would see him reaching out to each of them in different ways, inviting them to extend themselves in some way, uh, because that's how the master teacher taught. He's the ideal teacher. Many years ago, to seminary institute teachers, a very much younger boy, Kate Packer, who we miss, uh, gave a talk, a classic talk, called The Ideal Teacher. He talked about trying to be the ideal teacher, and I hate to get a spoiler alert if you've never read the talk, but he says, the ideal teacher is Jesus Christ, and we need to try and be as he is. Uh, he said, I'd like to talk about a teacher uh, with whom I have become acquainted. We all know him. Some of you know him intimately. Some of you just a casual acquaintance with him. But uh, for the duration of this talk, I would like to discuss this teacher with you. The teacher I would like to discuss with you is that teacher we carry in our minds, against whom all of you are measured by those of us who have responsibility of appraising you. This teacher, of course, is the ideal teacher. And in my, I, I forgot to mention, I also serve in BYU Idaho as a teaching group leader of one of the religion teaching groups. And so I get to go in to online classrooms and observe what teachers are doing and, and how they're interacting with their students. And I think this is, wow, I, what other institution are we measured against the perfect teacher? And that can be overwhelming, and I hope that the time we spend together today won't, won't overwhelm you, but will help you. The church produces wonderful materials to help us to be uh, teachers like the Savior, and I hope a lot of you are familiar with this new document that the church recently has come out with to help us in our teacher, teacher council meetings at the ward level. This is something that we all should be familiar with. The principles are priceless. And in here, are focused on teaching in a church setting, uh, in 2012, Seminaries and Institutes of Religion published this book. It's Gospel Teaching and Learning, and it's a guide to seminary and institute college-level teachers. And it's all about teaching in the Savior's way. Um, here's one paragraph from this wonderful book that's accessible online to everyone. He said, it says, reflect for a moment on what you know about the Savior. Can you see him in your mind with his disciples gathered around him? Can you see him teaching the multitudes beside the Sea of Galilee? Or speaking personally to the woman at the well, as depicted in the picture here. Uh, significantly, I think, depicted in the picture here. What do you notice about his way of teaching and leading? How did he help others learn, grow spiritually, and become converted to his gospel? He loved them, he prayed for them, and continually served them. He found opportunities to be with them, 
and express his love. He knew their interests, hopes, and desires, and he knew what was happening in their lives. He knew who they were and what they would become. He found unique ways to help them learn and grow, ways meant just for them. When they struggled, he did not give up on them, but continued to love them and minister to them. He prepared himself to teach by spending time alone in prayer and fasting. In daily private moments, he sought his Heavenly Father's guidance. He used the scriptures to teach and testify about his mission. He taught people to think about scriptures for themselves and use them to find answers to their own questions. Their hearts burned within them as he taught the word of God with power and authority. And they knew for themselves that the scriptures are true. And so the question I'd like you to ponder just for 30 seconds silently is, can you imagine the Savior teaching your online course? Can you imagine being a student in your course and on the other end of the computer, instead of you, who does a great job, there's the Savior Jesus Christ. How would the Savior teach an online class? Ponder that just silently for 30 seconds. What would his interactions with students in the course be like? Um, again, let's think, and then I'd like to hear from two or three of you if that would be okay. What do you think he'd be like as an online teacher of medical terminology or math or whatever, like accounting? It would be math. It would be math. It would be math? Yeah. The entire <laughs> inspired topic? Well, I mean, when uh, when Elder Clark was here and gave his devotional, yeah. he said that that, this, that that the Holy Ghost can help you with your studies. He even understands math. So, I mean, you know, Elder Clark knew what it was. So I mean, <laughs> Wonderful. So, if the Savior were a math teacher online, what would the characteristics of his course be, do you think? Or whatever you think. I'd love to hear from two or three of you if you're brave. Please. Um, I teach natural disasters. That's funny. But, um, <laughs> that's awesome. Sorry. <laughs> so, uh, but I, I think one of the things that he would teach is he taught people how to apply things. You know, like right. he gave these parables of things that people did, things that people knew about, people that farmed, like people that raised sheep, because that's what people were familiar with, and they could apply those principles of this is what this looks like every day. This is how I behave because I now have this teaching. And I feel like that's something that can be applied to all topics. I mean, I am learning this math because I can use it for this. Or even if I can't, I now have a better understanding of that bridge I'm driving over or of something that affects me daily. And so I feel that's one of the things the Savior would help his students know, like, why this is important and what they can do with that knowledge. Right. You know, he used mustard seeds and little birds and to teach profound truths. And in, in your unique disciplines that you teach, you too will find those gem of parables, that, you know, in math and accounting and natural disasters. You will find the Holy Ghost. The Savior prayed a lot because he knew he needed help and guidance. As you do so, those moments of inspiration will come to your mind, both as you present to your class generally, and as you interact with them individually. We'll talk more about that here in a second. Anybody else, what do you think the characteristics would be of the Savior if you taught it online? Whatever you teach, please. Imagine you have a lot of patience with students that I can sometimes miss. Yeah. He, he would always have, I'm just laughing, I just checked my email, but I shouldn't have done it right before this started, and here's a student who I've been begging to participate, and now, you know, we're, now he's pleading for I want to I want to serve him as the Savior would serve him, and it is challenging. It does require prayer because the answer may be different for different students. Please. Um, I appreciate that question. I appreciate the responses. The one thing that the Savior had, which we don't have, is he had an understanding of what their background was like. So he knew who was trying to just get just get by, right. and who was really struggling. And right. and we don't always have that, and so it's difficult to tell. We we don't have that. Um, but uh, we know in Doctrine and Covenants section 9 that A, we can learn by revelation, and that learning by revelation is facilitated by us exerting some effort to learn what we can on our own. That as we study it out in our minds, then the Holy Ghost makes up the difference. We, we can study it out a little bit in our minds, our students and their backgrounds. And we, can, we can do a few things to try and help ourselves get to know them. But then in that moment, the Holy Ghost will then help us to, to teach them as individuals, I believe. And I know you've seen that happen too. Please. I appreciate this conversation that's going on, and I Let's think go. that one of the things that is really important, though, to help them learn is consequences, consequences too, for actions or inaction. And so I think that 
you know, taking that opportunity to help them understand in a loving way is a teaching moment as well. Right. It's the sacred way. I don't know what my email back to the student will be sound like yet. I'll say a prayer and start typing later. Okay. Because patience does not make for mistakes. Right. We have high love and high right. expectations. And you know the story that you know what happens to Peter. What a slacker. He, he sunk into the water. Can you believe him? And the Savior puts him in. Peter, you need to have more faith. Um, we need to be like the master teacher. One more, or two, two more. Well, I'm just going to say, you know, that, that because the Savior knows the students what to do, he also has a great love for them. And uh, he knows what they can become. And uh, <coughs> he knows how to help them become. And when we pay the price, we can, we can to a measure and to a degree, see and love them in a measure as and that's, I think, our goal in Christ-like teaching. Last comment. Um, this two, two things. So going along with that, um, you know, I'm sure the Savior would really take that time. We're kind of already talking about this, but to get to know them and to build that relationship of trust with them. Like, I, I was a high school teacher before, and, well, you know, a lot of them didn't do very well in my class. They all trusted me. You know, like, I had a lot of students who would tell me everything about their other teachers and about their life that surprised me a lot. But I think he would go out of his way to build that relationship, to connect with them. Not, you know, if you have that student who isn't, you know, just quits, quits doing stuff, he wouldn't let that happen, right? He'd go after that student. He would, you know, work with that student. He'd try to talk to that student, try to encourage them to, to come back. Right. And then, you know, just one thought I had about, you know, talking about students and problems and patients and stuff. I recently had a student who just tore me apart. They would email, you know, attack me in every way they could. And, I had a lot of responses I wanted to give, but I spent a day waiting and thinking and praying about it, and I gave a much different response. And since then, I had a very different attitude from that student, and that wasn't, you know, that was because I was willing to, you know, ask for right. <laughs> for his help to actually do it the right way. So, right, I'm teaching a pilot class, and I learned three new for me, new for my students, and uh, <coughs> set up a phone appointment with a student who was struggling in the navigation of it, trying to help him in that conversation. Not very nice. And uh, as he was being harsh, um, so I don't always respond well to when I feel attacked, you know. And I just said, I just stopped. I said a little prayer. And I just tried to remember that my father loves him and that I need to love him too. It doesn't mean that I give him a pass on everything. In fact, it, most documents I think that I ask him to elevate. We'll talk about that here in a second. Thank you so much. So uh, there's, here's another little paragraph from this wonderful manual for, for higher level gospel teachers. Uh, it says, the Savior asks questions that cause them to think and feel, not just think, but to feel deeply. He was sincerely interested in their answers and rejoiced in their expressions, expressions of faith. He gave them opportunities to ask their own questions and share their own insights. And he responded to their questions and listened to their experiences. Because of his love, they felt safe in their thoughts and personal feelings expressing them with them. Do you see the things that he did? He asked questions that caused them to think and to feel. He was sincerely interested, and we'll talk more about that, in their answers. And I love this. And he rejoiced in their expressions of faith, something that good gospel teachers do. He gave them opportunities to ask their own questions, something that our courses are very much built, for the most part, to have our students do. And uh, he responded to their questions and listened. He listened to their experiences. He listened to them. And uh, again, because of his love, they felt safe sharing their thoughts and personal feelings. He listened to them. And I don't know about you, when, when I started teaching online, I thought, how will I listen to my students? In a classroom, it's pretty easy. I just listen to my students. How do you do that in an online classroom? And how do you do it in a way that the students know they're being listened to? We might be listening to them very effectively, but if they in return don't know that, then, then they may not be willing to engage with us at the level we hope that they will, whatever our subject might be. Well, again, the great news in online learning is that we are uniquely able to interact with each student like the Savior did in a way that gives us and them time to ponder and respond by the Spirit. Uh, I think that's one of the great advantages to online teaching. Um, sometimes I'll be doing my grading and I'll get to one, and I, I need to think about that one for a minute before I respond to it. And then I'll do the rest, and then some hours later, the next day, I'll come back when I've had a chance to ponder. In a classroom, I don't always have that 
that to that ability. I don't you have to respond in real time. It's one of the great advantages to online teaching and learning. Um, again, unlike real time classrooms, we get to hear from and listen to each and every student every lesson. You know, in an ideal religion class, you know, everybody at some point would raise their hand and share something, or we share in a group. But we know that most often, many do not. Well, in an online class, they do. If they have to, it's just how it works. It's a huge blessing and a huge advantage that I personally did not anticipate going into online teaching. Um, so I, I titled this, I know my BYU-Idaho online instructor is listening when. I think one of the, one of the great ways that we can show that we're listening is in how we give them feedback. Um, when students know they receive feedback that is specific to them and specific to their assignment, they know that their teacher is listening and will be more likely to engage their minds and hearts in the materials, whatever that material might be. I like to do a thing that I call reflective feedback. And, and uh, you know how you read the enzyme and, and the conference reports, and a lot of times there's a little bold and italicized paragraph at the beginning that kind of tells you the heart of what the message is about. I kind of try like to do that for my students' assignments when it's a you know an essay of some kind. I try and look to the point where they got to that feeling level. I copy, paste it, bold and highlight it, uh, and then I, I type a little response. Um, my response is usually just a sentence or two long, usually, sometimes much more. But they then know that I actually read what they wrote, and that I thought about it, and that I felt something as I read it. When we can help students to understand that we're really reading and feeling along with them, they will appreciate it, and, and they will be edified, and they will be prepared to learn in a deeper way than that deep learning that we seek for. I think we need to be careful in how we use templates and copied and pasted feedback. Um, great job is good. That's a good piece of feedback, unless you don't really think or feel that, unless you didn't really pay the price. And I know I've been tempted, you know, that you feel like you've got so many things to grade and you just want to do a good job. And I think that's okay sometimes. But time and time again, the same things, and, and uh, students can smell a template a mile away. Uh, a lot more, a lot more than we think, maybe. Please. Partially because I'm late, but, but <laughs> um, uh, so I never really did learn to use templates. And and but what I use all the time is um, I will um, paste something in Word, and then and then I can bring it in. But but um, when you do that, you can also modify it for the unique needs of that student. Exactly. And I believe that inspired teachers will be inspired to modify effective templates appropriately. I think templates are a yeah, I did. I was, slide. You know, I, 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 I'm not trying to throw rocks at people who use templates. No, I use them. Because um, you know, they're just smarter than me, and they figured out how to use them. <laughs> but um, you know, I'm just saying that you know, when you use it, then, then you can modify it. And Island 3 won't have the same kind of templating capabilities that we've had in the past, and I think that's probably good. Yeah, so I think that's one of the few things that people hear and they despair. Oh no, my templates were. I, I, it will be okay. It'll be all right. Um, <laughs> practice typing quickly. There's the, wow. There's some advanced knowledge for you. I like to do a thing that I call two pass grading. So in the first pass, I make sure that the technical aspects of the requirements of the assignment are met. They, they included A, B, and C. And then in the second pass, I like to go and look for the feeling level, the heart, where they've expressed something that, that has come forth from, from more than just their brain. And I and that's what I like to tag and copy and paste and bold and highlight. Oh, I love that sentence. So good. I feel this way sometimes. And sometimes, you know, I'll copy and paste a link to a scripture reference. Hey, check this one out too, because it, it has to do with what you're teaching here. So I, I'm I'm a graduate student. Wonderful. One of these online um, programs for the school. So my instructor just like two weeks ago just left a comment on one of one of my answers and she's like, wow, that was more elegant than the solution. And just that little comment like made me open up my answer and then dig into it and figure out why that was why that was elegant or whatever. And then um, and I was just looking at that and naturally I was learning a little bit deeper off of that comment. So in my mind comments and feedback Actually, promote learning. Absolutely. Thank you. From a student witness, excellent. Yes. <laughs> Please. So going with the two pass grading, and then the, yeah. the other part. I one of the things I do is I'm a, I teach a, a fundamental design class for non-design students, right? So like a lot of business students, 
the education anybody takes it. So what I do is besides doing, because there's a heavy amount of requirements for each assignment, like you must have the name right, you must have the size of your image right, right? Like there's a lot of that. But then the design part is the part that I really care about. And so what I do is I, with I learned three this semester trying it out, I've done audio feedback. Yes. And part of the reason I like that one is it's just a minute, so I can't do anything for too long. You know, I have a minute, right. say it, get it done. And that's nice. But also I like the fact that, you know, I, I can use that to focus on the good things. Right. Saying like, hey, this is stuff I like, or you know, really think about this and I can build a conversation that I would have in a, in person when I've taught in class, I can have kind of that and build that, you know, relationship to them hearing my voice, even if it's really low quality audio, it's still their <laughs> my voice and they're hearing me talking to them. So they do. Yeah. That headset of mine is hammered and sitting back in my backpack. It's been a priceless tool mm -hmm. for helping me to connect with my students. Again, do I feel like so often I get to know better than so many students that have sat in my classroom? Even though I've never, I'll never be able to shake their hand in person. So I feel like we've connected through yeah. things like that. And Island Three is wonderful to make it so quick for us to give that audio feedback. I hope we, I hope I can get more proficient at it. That's that's wonderful. Um, let me just talk about this last point. Give each student their their time. Uh, what, what do I mean by that? Well, you've probably seen a contract like this, right? And it says 30% of our time or our effort, I, I, I've never, I don't know if it's time or effort or what, but 30% of what we do is grading and providing feedback. And then we've got some other facilitation things that we can use some of that time off and to do what we're about to talk about. And so just, I'm, I'm no mathematician, but if we're gonna do 30% grading and feedback, so if I'm teaching a two credit class like religion classes are, or, or three, I, I'm going to be putting in about eight to eight hours on average, maybe 11, is the contracted expectation on average. So a teacher should be spending about two to four hours grading and giving feedback to assignments in a class like mine. Now mine has fewer discussion boards at the moment, so I can give you more time to that. And so if a teacher has 40 students, each student should be getting about five minutes of the teacher's undivided time in receiving their grades and personalized feedback. Again, that's 180 minutes, that's those three hours, divided by 40 students, about five hours per student. And what I've had to do sometimes is to use, this is a little online, I've got the, and it's on the, uh, in the PowerPoint that's on I Learned 3 for the conference. But uh, this is a great little online timer, you just pull it up on a web page, and you set it for four minutes, or however many, how much time you have for that student in that assignment. And then it'll ring every four minutes. And I try and use it to pace myself. And I say, I'm going to try and give each student their four minutes. And yeah, I'll leave a little extra time to budget in there for somebody who's having extra concerns or challenges. Uh, but it's so important that we give this positive feedback, because if the only thing they ever get is corrective, um, I know the Savior didn't teach that way. He definitely gave corrective feedback in, in clear ways. But uh, I'm confident that there was positive feedback continually from him. For him, he could do it in just a glance or a smile. For us, we got to use some other tools at our disposal, but they are effective tools. They're, they're really effective. Please, positive feedback maximizes learning. Yes. Because if, if what you're doing is negative feedback, most of the time what you're doing is you're bringing them up to a standard, right? So that when the moment comes when you need to say, hey, Peter, you need to have more faith, Peter listens. Because he's just. Another thing is that. Rather than say, you know, positive feedback can't just be you're doing a great job, but it has to be specific, personalized, specific to the assignment and to the student. Thank you, thank you. Um, so here's something to think about, and I think I, and early on I fell into this trap sometimes. If you're spending more time preparing screencasts and instructor notes than you are giving feedback in your grading, then you might be out of balance, and as a result, your students may not feel like you're listening to them. Um, we have a smaller portion of our effort designated to these things. Our courses are well built. And where they need issues, there are voices that listen. Our focus, we're teachers of students. We teach students. They should be our focus. And so often we want to tell them what we know. And, 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 and they'll listen if they know that we love them. <coughs> um, but but if, we're more, if we're more a talking head, even if we, well, I'll tell that story here. Well, I'll tell that story now. So. Uh, here, here is a, I blanked out the name. I'm a teaching group leader. This is one of my instructors. When I first went into this instructor's course for the first time when I first met this instructor, I was a little concerned. Um, his profile picture was like 
sideways, tilted. And it was just, you know, it was just some quick text about him, not this long, beautiful thing about him. I think he tried to paste a screencast in about his family, but the, the link was broken or something. And I thought, oh, this is going to be a high maintenance instructor this term, you know. And uh, but as a TGL, I need to serve the one, and that's good. Um, so you know, I talked with him, and, and he he said, oh yeah, I'll, I'll get those things fixed, and he did. And it's still his notes are very basic, you know, not cute, cute level, very low, um, content level, medium to low. But then I started to see his feedback to students: uh, sincerity level high, frequency high specificity high and his students love him uh, what they had to say about it was glowing what they had to say about him. Um, the Savior called carpenters and fish he was a carpenter he called fishermen to, to lead in his church um, it's the simple caring heart of his servants that will make a difference in the lives of students and the students in his class are internalizing their care which is so important to so important to so I think that's just something to think about. Something to think about. Something else on discussion boards, just quickly. If students know that their teacher responds to them personally on the discussion boards, that goes a long way. And you know, 30% is grading and feedback, and then another 30% is that facilitation, which primarily speaks to discussion boards. Um, we, we need to respond to them again more than just a great. I remember once I was doing a course visit. And, uh, you know, Brain Honey, uh, excuse me, Rice Face will show you all these statistical, you know, oh, this instructor has responded this many times and his number was through the roof, you know, and I thought, oh, this is, i got to go check this out. And it was almost always, good job, great job, well, you know, and it was, it was to every student multiple times, but it didn't reflect, and he, he very well could have been reading and internalizing, I think he probably was, but he wasn't reflecting that effectively back to the students. Um, I think it's better if our feedback is, is fewer posts with more personal feedback. Personal feedback is better than frequent but not personal feedback. So, um, again, more than, more than good talks. Oh, I forgot to mention, one thing I like to do is keep a spreadsheet when I've got a class with, with discussion boards that are you know consistent week in and week out. And I like to keep track of when I, I've made a more detailed reply to one student and so that I kind of spread it around the class. Um, and that way, once every two, three weeks, a student's getting a, a what I like to call a value-added post from me, where I'm including scripture links or quotes from the brethren. My posts may not be as frequent as others, but they've always got, got meaningful material. At least they try to make it so they always do. Uh, again, I call it the unlockable stuff. As an instructor uh, of the scriptures, you know, we can go many different directions with with different chapters and passages. And I've got a list of things that I'd like to teach, but I'd like, I'd like to wait for the student to make a comment to unlock it. And so, you know, if they unlock it, then I post it in there. And uh, I think students kind of catch on and say, oh, there's more we can gain if we engage. Uh, there's stuff that my teacher has to share that he can see that I'm really seeking. to so share, I think the same thing that way. Um, one of my favorite things to do, so I'm, I'm monitoring a discussion board and somebody makes just a powerful post. Often it's when a student will reply to another student's post. So I think something that we need to train our students to do is listen to each other on the discussion board. So when I see somebody's made an original post and then somebody makes a powerful reply, instead of replying to them on the discussion board, I'll just click that. Uh, and Brightspace is great. You got that little email link. Hey, I just saw your reply to so-and-so. Oh, I thought it was so great. And that's just me and that student talking. I'm not announcing it to the class. I'm just reinforcing it to them privately uh, with no no other agenda than to just say thank you. And uh, I love to do that. All right, please. On discussion boards, one other thing that I found to be super effective on this whole value-added reply that you're mentioning um, is, and you also talk about getting students to listen to each other and to reply more effectively to each other, is in that reply to ask deeper and more specific questions. So as you're asking, hey, that's a really great comment. You mentioned this experience you had. If you're comfortable, I'd love to learn more about that experience. Or tell me, you know, what were some of the lessons you learned from it? And then not only will that student most often reply, but other people will also respond to that question. And you get this really deeper kind of sub-discussion going on that can often be where the rubber really hits the road. I'm so glad you made that comment because I think in that is what that's the savior saying, if we're trying to teach, I can't walk on water. Okay. Um, 
but I can say, hey, step out a little more. Exercise a little more faith. And I invite you now to walk towards this, this piece of knowledge or this truth. And they will respond. And sometimes when you get to that level, sometimes the posts are a little awkward like Peter was on the one. But real growth is taking It may not look as clean. It may not look as nice. But real growth is taking place. Deep learning is taking place. And sometimes deep learning involves sinking, right, as Peter did. And that's okay. If they step beyond where they were, we serve them well. So I have a question on that because I Please. tried to do that too. I don't know if it's like the structure clause, especially when we're still in this class. But it's because it's better in the class. But I never get responses. Like when I post on my session boards, I am, it's a good week if I get one response to 12 posts. Right. Out of, out of not many. And I just wonder, like, what is a way to encourage students to get involved in the discussion boards? <laughs> You might be getting a lot more responses than you know about. They're just not written. Yeah. I think that's true. I think also, um, uh, I think we're growing so fast. And yeah. these courses get built thoughtfully and meaningfully. But I think we will learn, and somebody needs to do a PhD, about effective discussion board questions. Mm -hmm. Just like we ask more or less effective questions in a classroom setting. There are more and less effective questions in discussion boards. And sometimes they're pre-programmed into our course, mm -hmm. and so we don't we don't mess with those. Again, we, we need to stick within the course parameters that we have given. But I think I've gotten better at asking good discussion yeah. board questions, but it was a process of time for me. Well, one of the things I know, like in my discussion boards, they're not required to respond to each other. So they don't respond to each other either. Um, everybody just like does their one post and goes home and right. they check. Back. Uh -huh. Yeah, if you've seen the, if you ever seen the video that BYU Idaho produced about what if a discussion board were in a real classroom? Yeah, I wish I had it. It's hilarious. Okay. It's so funny. And I think that's partly a course design issue. And yeah. I think we, uh, especially from the leadership conference yesterday, we need to be commuting with the, communicating with our OCRs, mm -hmm. with our course leads through the OCR, and say, hey, might it not be better if we if we raise an expectation on the discussion board in this way. Mm -hmm. I know many people have negative feelings about discussion boards. I love them. I, 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 I love them. Think there's, a, there's a structural difference outside of the instructor community because I taught two different classes. And with my first, like they were required to make responses. And it was amazing. Like, you know, it's sad that you have to have that requirement. They get in there and they would go back and forth and you have those discussions and you're like, for fees. Yeah, it's like, I, I understand why everybody in my group hates it. I do too, but I've seen the like potential. So. Okay. I apologize to that end. The OL300 has, has, a, has a module on the discussion board. Okay. It's, it is tremendous. Okay. And, it, and it's all about not just not just responding, but deepening responses and helping, helping others uh, get more out of the discussion board. Glad you mentioned that. Please. I think this is a great opportunity, too, for them to. Um, Perpetuate the spirit of risks. And maybe if you can help them understand that, they'll see the value of the discussion board. What if it's on the requirement in the class? Yeah. I love hearing uh, President Gilbert talk about the learning model today. It's alive and well. And, and again, we're so many of the courses that we teach are freshly built. We haven't been doing this for all that long. Uh, humbly and prayerfully, we ought to give suggestions to our OCRs as how we might better implement the spirit of that. In, especially in our technical classes, I think it's, it's, it's I think there's real potential there to teach parable-like things. Uh, uh, we have contracted work, but with some time accountability. Uh, here are some things from our contract: uh, you can just pay actively in our course five days a week, uh, put in the right amount of time. I recommend that you keep a couple of lists, whether you do it on a spreadsheet or however you do it. Uh, it's lists where you know things about your students when they break the ice that first week. Um, make a note or two or three about them, and try and you know memorize their names and say, "Oh, that's Bob, and he lives here, and he does this." Uh, just to start at the beginning of your course, just to start building, that will continue to build through the course. Um, I don't know that we take, need to take a ton of time on ice breaking. I think we build relationships in process once we've broken the ice. Um, I think, again, I mentioned this earlier, keep track of the times you've responded to them personally on a discussion board or via email, and make sure you, you know, you, you spread the love in your course, and so each student knows that you, you care about them personally and individually. And one thing that I'd recommend you do, I don't know about you, but I'll sit down on my computer and time just flies. And sometimes I don't keep track of my time and how I'm using it. Um, 
keep track of your time. I think it can go both ways. You end up putting in a lot more time than you're asked to do. And maybe sometimes we think we put in time when we haven't. Um, Elder Holland said, let's get to that. I think I have an unrushed atmosphere, and this is from the Gospel Teaching and Learning Handbook. Uh, an unrushed atmosphere is absolutely essential if you're to have the Spirit of the Lord present in your class. If we're rushing through grading, <laughs> and we do sometimes, but if we're consistently rushing through grading, um, I think we're not allowing the Spirit bandwidth in our minds and hearts to, to prompt us to give encouragement at that moment when it will mean the most. Um, uh, we can get rushed in an online classroom, even though it's, it's asynchronous. And so, um, the master teacher, Elder Holland, we can project that unrushed atmosphere in our classes and we can let our students know that we have time for them. Um, Dr. Covenant, section 50, uh, as I wrap it up here, um, the Lord talks about teaching in a way that builds, that edifies. And uh, at this point in church history, it was, it was, the church was brand new. And they were still trying to learn and teach, and some crazy things were happening. And the Lord came in and said, look, here is how gospel teaching and learning works. And then he said this, such an important verse, wherefore he or she, of course, that preacheth, and he or she that receiveth. They need to understand one another, and they need to be both edified and rejoiced together. Um, I've been amazed in my online teaching and how a student can submit something on a Saturday night and then I get to it on a Monday afternoon. And although hours separate us, the spirit seems to close the gap. And then all of a sudden I'm right with them. I'm feeling with them something that, uh, you know, they may be off at their job doing something else in that moment, and yet through the spirit we connect and we're edified together I, I, and rejoice together. I don't think we can be effective teachers like the Savior if we don't have this moment happening in some way in our classes and um, I believe in online learning where uniquely, we uniquely can do this. More so, I think, even than what uh, the classroom teacher might be able to do. I'm, I'm starting to be a little biased. Um, when students know they're loved and respected by their teacher and other students, they're more likely to come to class ready to learn. We've talked about all these things. Teachers should develop the love and respect they have for their students. Doing so will help them radiate the pure love of Christ for their students and help them teach with patience and compassion. That doesn't mean to not hold them to high standards. We need to hold them to high standards. But when you do it with love and compassion, it sure goes over a lot better, right? Right? I just want to share, um, oh, this last sentence. You should listen carefully as students ask questions or share. We need to be good listeners to our students as the Savior was. Uh, again, from this talk from President Packer that he gave many years ago. He said this, the attributes which it has been my choice and privilege to recognize in you, brothers and sisters, over these years that you've been observing seminary teachers and institute teachers, they're no more or less than the image of the master teacher showing through. I believe that to the degree you perform according to the challenge and charge which you have, the image of Christ does become great on your countenances, and I would add, through your communications to students. Um, and for all practical purposes, in that classroom, in that feedback, in that discussion board, at that time, and in that expression, with that inspiration, you are he, and he is you. The transfusion takes place, and by no unfriendly chance or bad company can you ever quietly lose the benefit. The Spirit has great power to overcome what we sometimes feel are the limitations of our online teaching and learning. I would invite you as we finish today, and we send you off. Um, how, how will you achieve this transfusion? How will you let the, the image of the Savior communicate out to your students uh, across the miles and across the hours and across the semester? Uh, we only get to be with them for a few months, but the Savior will be with them forever. And if we can connect to that relationship and help to facilitate that relationship, we have served them well. I know that the Savior does. I'm so grateful for his scriptures. I'm grateful for the knowledge that he allows us to have. In these latter days, that blesses our lives the most. So I thank you for coming up and hanging out with me today. And I say, in the name of Jesus Christ, amen. Good luck getting to your next class.